Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for all of you attendees for attending. Um, this is a third of our annual results uh, presentations, and it is good to be able to report a very strong operating result for the financial year. Record prices and margins and strong cash flow are the elements of that result. At Oloroz, we had a record full-year revenue up 24% to $148.9 million on sales of 11,837 tonnes. Our sales price was a record $12,578 a tonne FOB basis, and the price we received so far this financial year is $14,000 a tonne. The cost of sales was a little bit over $4,000 a tonne and gave us a record margin of over $8,000 per tonne. The EBIT dakes of $94.6 million was up 33% on the previous corresponding period. Oloroz was once again strongly cash flow positive, internally funding uh, and approved $40 million of early works for Stage 2 expansion. At the corporate level, uh, we had a record underlying net profit of $25.7 million. Uh, that's a statutory group uh, net profit of $1.9 million after making allowance for the borax impairment of $8 million and other items of $15.8 million. Neil will talk uh, in some detail about those aspects. Our, our cash balance uh, at the end of the year was $316.7 million and we had a net cash position of $229 million. So a strong year for Oracobre. And with that, I'll pass over to our CFO, uh, Neil Kaplan. Thank you, Richard, and a good morning to all. First up is the Oloroz joint venture structure. The transaction with Toyota Chusho Corporation earlier this year resulted in TTC owning 15% of Orocobre. Coupled with its 25% direct investment into the Oloroz project, TTC now has an effective 35% of the project. This transaction strengthens our alignment with the Toyota Group and is a demonstration of their confidence and commitment to Oloroz. Orocobre has a 72.68% ownership in SDJ PTE, which in turn has a 91.5% interest in Sales de Jujuy SA, giving Orocobre an effective 66.5% interest in Sales de Jujuy SA. The statutory accounts show such investment as being equity accounted due to joint control being exercised with Toyota Chusho. We have therefore presented the joint venture on a 100% basis and then eliminate the non-controlling interest to show what Orocobre's accounts would look like on a proportionally consolidated basis. Moving on to the next slide, this slide details the P&L on a proportionally consolidated basis. Moving from left to right, the first column is the statutory P&L as shown in the accounts. The second column shows the joint venture on a 100% basis, whilst the third column eliminates the non-controlling interest. Column 4 adds back the equity accounted amount resulting in column 5, which is what Orocobre's P&L looks like on a proportionally consolidated basis. Looking at column 2 on a 100% basis, a strong profitable year for the joint venture with revenues of US $149 million and EBITDAX of $94.6 million, US dollars, which are up 24% and 33% respectively year on year. Forex losses of US 10 million were a result of the substantial peso devaluation, which mainly affected the peso denominated VAT balance at SDJSA. The income tax charge at SDJ includes a substantial charge due to changes in Argentine tax legislation related to future withholding taxes on dividends, partially offset by the benefit from the future company tax rate reduction, as well as the impact of the peso devaluation on carried forward tax losses. This is a non-cash book entry required by the accounting standards. On a proportion consolidated basis, Orocobre had revenues of US $116.4 million and EBITDAX of $54 million US dollars, which are up 20% and 39% respectively year on year. Taking Forex losses and then Borax impairment into account, this resulted in a profit before tax of US $23.7 million, and following the substantial increase in the SDJ tax charge, as mentioned previously, a net profit after tax of just under $2 million. Moving on to the next slide, 
This waterfall chart breaks down the proportionally consolid consolidated P&L from Orocobre's perspective. It takes the statutory net profit and works towards the underlying net profit, detailing the items affecting the statutory profit that are generally non-recurring in nature. It should be noted that the cash items are the transaction costs, sale of exploration asset profit, and share of the advantage lithium corporate costs, which together are net negative $100,000, whilst all the other non-cash items make up almost the entire difference of the underlying net profit. As can be seen, the statutory net profit of US $1.9 million following the detailed adjustments results in an underlying net profit of US $25.7 million. Moving on to the next slide, this slide shows the proportionally consolidated balance sheet of Orocobre, which is detailed in the same format as the P&L. The balance sheet is much stronger. Under current assets, cash has increased on a proportionally consolidated basis to approximately US $330 million, principally due to the strategic placement to TTC and entitlement offer of US $287 million gross, and cash on hand at SDJ of approximately $20 million. Inventory under current assets and non-current assets increased largely due to brine inventory, finished goods, and reagents such as soda ash as well as critical spare parts. VAT reduced significantly due to the Argentine peso devaluation and collection of outstanding VAT due to SDJ. Under non-current assets, the investment in the associate of US $20 million is Orocobre's investment in Advantage Lithium, resulting from the sale of South American Salaz. This reduced by US $1.5 million as Orocobre booked its share of Advantage Lithium's head office costs. Included under other are financial assets, which is the rest restricted security deposit in the debt service reserve account, which is required in terms of the Mizuho Jogmeg project debt. Under current and non-current liabilities, loans and borrowings have decreased from $136 million to $102 million, mainly as a result of the two project debt repayments during the year and repayment of part of the working capital facilities. The deferred tax liability has increased at SDJ, mainly due to the effect of the change in Argentine tax law and devaluation of tax losses, as mentioned earlier. Moving to the next slide. The proportionally consolidated cash flow shows strong cash flows from Olaroz. On a proportionally consolidated basis, over $33 million was generated from operating activities, in addition to proceeds from the strategic placement to TTC and entitlement offer of $287 million gross, and the release of the balance of standby letters of credit of $9.8 million, which resulted in a closing proportionally consolidated cash balance of US $341 million made up of just under 330 million US in cash and 11.4 million dollars in financial assets. The movements related to Ola Ros are detailed in the following slide. SDJ is repaying debt, releasing cash and investing in the future as a result of a strong EBITDAX of 94.6 million dollars. A capital increase of $12.3 million was required as a guarantee and paid into the debt service reserve account, which is related to the Mizuho Jogmeg project debt. The $12.3 million is included as part of the $17.1 million, which is restricted cash and is recorded under financial assets. Finance costs are related to the Mizuho interest, interest rate swap, and working capital facilities. Salazi Huhui repaid Mizuho Bank principal of $22.3 million during the year related to the project debt. CapEx of $19.6 million was paid during the period, which included $5.3 million of expansion capital. We have split the working capital movement into its components. There is a $7.4 million increase in reagents, which is mainly soda ash, a learning from our experiences last winter, as well as increased critical spare parts. Finished goods increased by $1.4 million due to shipping congestion at the end of June. There was an increase in accounts receivable of $5.2 million and a decrease in accounts payable of $2 million. The brine inventory movement mainly relates to higher well pump rates building up volume for stage two and heavy secondary liming of high magnesium 
in Pond 4B in the first half of the financial year. The above has resulted in net, net cash generated of $15.4 million and restricted cash of $17.1 million. Moving to the next slide, strong cash flows have helped to reduce the Olaroz project debt facility down from $192 million to approximately $122 million, which translates to US $70 million of principal paid over the past three years. The September payment, which is due within the next two weeks' time, is taken into account in the numbers mentioned. Given the DSRA security deposit of $17.1 million, this results in a net $105 million outstanding on the project debt. This facility has a low average interest rate of approximately 4.25% over its tenure and is repaid biannually through September 2024. Orocobre has net cash of US $229 million as at 30 June. Moving on to the next slide. Over the past four to five years, inflation has outrun devaluation, which has resulted in a negative effect for both Salas de Jujuy and Borax. As can be seen from the above graph, the Argentine peso devalued approximately 73% against the US dollar during the financial year, and against inflation of approximately 30%. The significant devaluation occurred from April 2018 onwards. Whilst the devaluing peso can result in temporary cost benefits, it can also have a positive or negative effect on the monetary assets and liabilities on the balance sheet. In the current year, it had a significant adverse effect on the VAT peso denominated receivable. The impact of devaluation had a net increase of US $110 per tonne on production cost at SDJ due to inflation outrunning devaluation during most of the financial year, whilst creating a forex loss of approximately US $10 million, mainly related to VAT, and an increased tax expense of $3.5 million due to the net impact of revaluing carried forward tax losses. So, in summary, even in ramp-up, we have established ourselves as one of the world's highest margin producers. We have strong cash flows and are paying down debt, and we have a strong balance sheet which has been further bolstered by the TTC transaction, allowing Orocobre to be fully financed for its growth plans. Thank you, and I will pass you back to Richard. Thank you, Neil. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about our growth projects because if we're adding to those uh, summary points that uh, uh, Neil just made, we also have a clear path towards growth. Uh, so first of all, I will talk a little bit about stage two. This is slide 15 of the presentation. Uh, and um, off the back of um, a pre-investment decision decision, uh, we are spending approximately $40 million uh, on early stage works at Ola Ros. Uh, that includes uh, um, some new ponds, roads, vegetation clearing for the entire pond network, uh, drilling, camp infrastructure, and of course advancing the engineering uh, for the new plant. Um, in terms of the expansion, uh, the stage two expansion is uh, aimed to add an additional 25,000 tonnes of primary grade lithium carbonate uh, to give an overall productive capacity of 42,500 tonnes. The product mix, uh, when at full production, will be 17,500 tonnes per annum of purified lithium carbonate and 25,000 tonnes per annum of primary grade lithium carbonate, of which 9,500 tonnes will be the feed for the 10,000 tonne per annum lithium hydroxide plant at Naraha in Japan. Commissioning of the expansion uh, is aimed at uh, uh, the first half of uh, calendar year 2020, uh, and we're uh, aiming at a lower operating cost uh, than our current uh, operations because it's only a primary circuit. So we do not have the cost of operating the purification circuit. Capital cost, uh, $285 million, excluding VAT. Uh, and as we've mentioned, we've already started the early stage construction matters, uh, construction activities, uh, and we await final approval, uh, which is expected shortly. We have all the approvals in place for what is necessary on the ground. If we turn the page, I'll give you an example of some of the work that we're doing and a little bit of a feel for the project. 
Uh, we have a satellite image there on the right, uh, a recent one, I think it's only a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we can so, see the current uh, pond network, uh, the pond system, and we can also see uh, two new harvest ponds in operation, replacing the harvest ponds that are currently going through pond harvesting. Uh, the pond design uh, for the stage two is 13, uh, well, uh, is nine square kilometers of ponds. Uh, our current pond system is a little less than 4.5 square kilometers. Uh, so we're building redundancy into the design of our, of our new pond system. Uh, and just to say a little bit more about ponds, if you look at our capital allocation, you can see that wells and ponds are the largest part of what we have to do. Uh, looking a little bit at the lithium hydroxide plant in, uh, in Japan, at Naraha, uh, this is advancing uh, uh, well at the moment. We're finalizing arrangements with the contractor uh, for the building of the plant. Uh, and the strategy here uh, is off the back of increasing demand for N NMC and NCA format uh, cathodes, which require lithium hydroxide to be very much part of that market and be in the supply chain there. So the, the first element of that is this 10,000 ton per annum plant. Uh, we should be aware uh, that the plant is uh, being designed uh, to allow space for expansion uh, and the potential ultimately for the capacity of that plant or that area uh, uh, that we have there at Naraha is a potential 20,000 tons. So 10,000 tons first. Um, and um, we can see the motivations for this uh, strategy um, we're looking at uh, 80 gigawatt hours of uh, uh, nickel-based cathodes in 2017, growing to a forecast 816 gigawatt hours by 2025. So the capex here, uh, 60 to 70 million dollars, uh, pre-subsidies and financing um, for a 10,000 ton lithium hydroxide plant, which will deliver premium product. So we're designing for the very best product here at premium pricing. This provides the product diversification uh, for different battery technologies. Uh, the ownership structure will reflect the non-HEMSA ownership structure uh, that we currently have, so the relationship with TTC and Oracobre. Uh, and uh, there's a, a significant margin growth here as this is a value-added exercise. Operating costs will be approximately $1,500 a tonne. Uh, that's excluding the cost of the lithium carbonate going into the, uh, into the plant. Uh, down from our original estimates of $2,500 a tonne in our scoping studies. And we have received uh, approvals for $27 million of uh, Japanese uh, government subsidies, and we are finalizing the other debt packages uh, to support this project. And we expect to see commissioning during the first half of 2020 in line with the expansion at Olaroz. If we turn the page to the uh, to page 18, um, the third leg of growth we have uh, at the moment is, of course, the Advantage Lithium Kauchari JV. Um, we sold SAS, SAS into Advantage Lithium um, early last year. Uh, the capital raising for the company was completed, I think, in February, and since then the company has made a fantastic. Um, performance in drilling out here and giving the project a real push. Uh, so at the end of that drilling, uh, there's a six-fold increase of resources to 3 million tons of lithium carbonate equivalent uh, at 450 milligrams per litre lithium. It's a good quality brine with nice chemistry, very similar to the Olaroz chemistry. Uh, that hasn't defined the resource in total. Uh, there's significant potential at depth uh, and also to the south. Uh, so there's a phase three drilling program underway uh, to increase this inferred resource or upgrade this inferred resource to indicated and, uh, and or measured uh, and, um, and, um, and increase the resource also. Um, Advantage uh, completed a preliminary study into the technical and economic viability of the project in accordance with Canadian standards uh, and that has justified the movement of the project to complete the feasibility study um, in Q2 uh, next calendar year. A little bit to say about Borax Argentina. Uh, Borax Argentina had an improved year. Uh, EBITDAX moved to break even uh, 
and if we include the asset sale of uh, uh, of our exploration assets there, uh, it made a $2.4 million um, uh, contribution. 2017 uh, was a $1.7 million loss. Uh, sales were um, approximately the same, but margins were improved, resulting in the break-even. So we're seeing production performance improving with lower unit costs, and now we're benefiting from the recent peso devaluation. Um, there's been an impairment of $8, sorry, $8 million, reducing the carry value of the plant and equipment to nil. Uh, trading conditions are improving. Uh, the last four months, we saw an increase in sales 12% year on year. Uh, and we continue to work on the expansion at uh, Tinkalayu, um, and uh, the, the studies are under review at the moment, and that is regarding an a, a approximately four times uh, increase in borax decahydrate equipment capacity to, uh, and also adding a 40,000 tonne boric acid plant there. With that, I will pass the uh, presentation over to Tara Berry, who will take us, over, uh, take us through market considerations. Thank you, Richard, and good morning, everybody. The lithium market has attracted mixed sentiment in recent months, as forward indicators have been interpreted differently by market commentators and spectators. A shift in short-term indicators that are highly transparent and reportedly represent a view of the market today have overshadowed long-term fundamentals, which remain the same. The ramp-up rates of supply projects continue to be underestimated, and increasingly, we see solid demand infrastructure being put into place, including government mandates and battery chain capacity. And while the market is young, the results of growth initiatives are already visible. And I'll elaborate a little bit more on that shortly. Moving on to slide 23. Undeniably, the most commonly referred to indicator weighing on market sentiment is the Chinese spot price. The market has become fixated on its path since the, since the start of 2018, when it first showed signs of softening. From a demand perspective, the revision to China's EV policy has slowed demand while the downstream battery chain adjusts operations. And on the supply side, new spodumene concentrate from Australian producers has improved the output of conversion plants. Furthermore, reports of increased production from Chinese brine producers has helped in the short term, although this is highly seasonal. Furthermore, little information is, has been released regarding the quality of Chinese brine product, which has a long history of challenges relating to high levels of magnesium. Reports that this new supply is largely industrial or technical grade suggest that quality and capability of Chinese supplies remains a limitation. When you calculate out the cost to convert the only independent concentrate product from Australia to a lithium carbonate equivalent, you can see that the cost of production arrives at approximately 12,500 tonnes, uh, 12 per tonne, which is in line with recent seaborne contract prices. Moving on to slide 24. On the basis on the basis of our understanding of the supply chain from Chinese and Australian DSO and concentrate producers to the Chinese downstream conversion plant market, Aura Cobre believes the downstream conversion plant bottleneck remains. A misalignment between the project timelines of new Australian producers and Chinese conversion plants has resulted in continued inventory build of product that is largely unfamiliar and of a lower grade to the benchmark imported product being Greenbush's material, which is at least 6% grade. Furthermore, technical knowledge within the Chinese conversion plant market remains highly concentrated amongst established suppliers and converters disadvantaging new spodumene producers with inexperienced partners. As a result, it is our view that the Chinese conversion plant bottleneck will persist for some time until new Australian producers successfully commission product optimization projects and achieve the grades required. Moving on to slide 25. Like the, con like the Chinese conversion market, very little is known about the spot price and its methodology and particularly whether there is a relationship 
to contract prices. There are very little similarities between the drivers of spot and contract pricing. The size, quality, length and nature of the supplier-customer relationship vary significantly. Further detracting from the viability of the spot price as a robust market indicator is that in times of inactivity in the spot market, like we've seen in 2018 to date, the spot price is arrived at through market speculation rather than physical trades. So in summary, spot prices reflecting short-term and perhaps emotional sentiment are recovering from an overbought position from just under 12 months ago. And what we are seeing now with the convergence between contract pricing and spot pricing is a rebalancing. Moving on to slide 26. The new EV subsidy was put into place in February 2018 with a transition period to June 2018, allowing for continued subsidisation of lower range EVs but at a slightly reduced rate. As a result, it's possible there may have been a lag in the modification of the battery chain production lines while inventories were also worn down. But when you take a closer look at the change in the structure of the Chinese subsidy in terms of the EV range requirements, you can understand the need and increased incentive encouraging a prompt retooling in the battery chain. The focus of the market has been on the reduced incentive for lower range vehicles rather than focusing on the potential benefit to battery technology achieved through higher range vehicles which require a nickel based technology rather than the cobalt dominant format as demonstrated by the, by the chart on the bottom right. What is underappreciated also is that the new policy provides a higher potential subsidy for EVs over 300 kilometres. In 2017, the average range of the global EV fleet was 245 kilometres. And given the acceleration in battery technology that we've seen in recent times, it's possible the 300 kilometer range requirement will be reached sooner rather than later. In terms of the timeline for the retooling, large cathode and battery manufacturers have indicated that new nickel-based capacity is currently being commissioned and will come online in 2019, and we expect the raw material impact will occur late 2018. Moving on to slide 27. The range in terms of potential demand scenarios remains highly variable, which is expected given we are at the very early stages of the lithium market's development. Furthermore, the battery chain or the battery market has attracted significant interest from parties directly and indirectly contributing to its growth. However, what is undeniable is government mandates continue to grow. Oracobre is encouraged by widespread collaboration between government and battery chain participating in formulating strategies to encourage EV adoption, encompassing infrastructure, energy storage requirements and EV performance improvements. When we consider the range of potential outcomes here, we can see that government mandate secures at least 800,000 tonnes of demand by 2025. Meanwhile, the aspirational government initiative targeting 30% EV penetration rates by 2025 will result in at least 1.5 million tonnes of demand. Moving on to slide 27. The, the impact that government mandates have already had on the market is perhaps underappreciated. The market's focus has been directed more towards the effect that government mandates ha have had on the battery and car manufacturers rather than consumers. Here, you can see the growing financial impact that government initiatives have already had on the affordability of EVs. And in 2017, government mandates subsidised almost a quarter of the total spend on EVs. We believe that this trend will continue with widespread participation from local, state and central governments around the world, which ultimately means there is a potential of an earlier tipping point in the demand curve, whereby the cost of ownership for EVs will fall below internal combustion engine vehicles before the commonly referred to tipping point being between 2022 to 2025.
Moving to the final market slide. In summary, like our fellow South American producers, we believe market demand growth will continue at rates at or above 20% compound growth to 2025. Tight supply, particularly for battery-grade carbonate and hydroxide, will persist due to challenges ramping up highly technical projects. And on the demand side, all key indicators, particularly those exhibited by the EV and ESS markets, remain strong. And now I'll pass it over to Richard to provide a summary for us. Thank you, Tara. So in summary, Oracobra is in a strong position. It's uh, started its life and established itself as a low-cost, high-margin producer with an Otto's EBIT DAX of $94.6 million this year. We're forecasting higher production next year than last year. We've got uh, growth projects fully funded. That's Oleroz expanding to 42,500 tonne per annum, of which early stage work is underway, and a 10,000 tonne per annum lithium hydroxide plant to be built in Japan. And we expect final investment decisions on both those projects shortly. Both projects are expected to be commissioned in the first half of 2020. The lithium market, as Tara has taken us through, the fundamentals remain strong. Uh, we're just seeing, as I've talked about before, some of that short-term volatility. Uh, in the market. We have further staged expansions to grow Oleroz production. Uh, stage 3 was discussed at the time of the TTC investment and we have Kauchari and our, and our um, Advantage Lithium a relationship there also. And Borax is showing improving results with the last four month sales up 12% year on year. And with that um, I will pass back to the um, coordinator and we can take some questions. Thank you. If you wish to ask a question via the phones, please press star 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. If you wish to cancel your request, please press star 2. If you are on a speakerphone, please pick up the handset to ask your question. Your first question comes from Clark Wilkins from Citigroup. Please go ahead. Hi, Richard. Um, just a few question on the market and then just a, one on the production side. Um, the sort of visibility on pricing, I think you, the comment on the slide there is a realised price to date of about $14,000 a tonne. You know, how, how much coverage do you have going forward in terms of the contract position and you know, what can we, you know, we expect, I suppose, prices to come back to where, uh, as the comment there was about where the um, you know, $12,500 a tonne, sort of where the, the sort of spot prices across the market are at the moment for sort of more contract volume versus the spot market. And also just the comment, I think um, Neil said earlier about the, I think it was one of the drivers of the uh, imagery with some increased uh, lime use in one of the ponds for magnesium. Is that is that a issue with higher magnesium than expected in, in terms of the brines being pumped or is that just a concentration issue in one of the ponds? Uh, let's answer the second question first. Um, uh, the issue is actually we discussed this in the half yearly results. Uh, is actually the high magnesium content that was in a pond, uh, pond 4B uh, and it had got left out of circuit uh, due to some early stage commissioning issues. It was full and was concentrating, but it had high magnesium. So bringing it back into circuit uh, required a secondary liming process to remove the magnesium. Uh, that the, the majority of that happened uh, in part of the, of the previous financial year and the first half of this financial year. Um, back to the market aspects, um, uh, the, I'm just trying to remember the flavor of the question. Uh, the, the comment about the, uh, the operating costs for, uh, for spodumene is really providing a floor price at current spodumene prices. Um, so that's where we see the current floor. Uh, of course, if the spodumene uh, prices were to reduce, then there's potential for the floor to decrease. Um, and this is where we see actually the low point in the demand cycle. Uh, so as Tara has indicated, uh, we would expect to see demand pick up off the back of the uh, cathode plants uh, being brought back online after their retooling in China. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if that's answered the question because I can't quite exactly remember the, the words. Well, of it. I, I, oh, sorry, I, contracts. Got the, got the idea of contracts, if I'm reminded. Uh, we, we're, we are... Most of our um, uh, forecast production for this current half, uh, the lion's share of that is, uh, is, uh, is put away. 
There's a small amount that is not, uh, and we'll be finalizing the terms on that uh, shortly. Um, uh, we have, um, uh, but we don't have any, uh, any material amount covered into next year. So we'll be going through the normal process of the annual negotiations uh, in the last quarter uh, and, uh, of, this, uh, of this current calendar year. Thank you. Your next question comes from Nick Herbert from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Hi, all. Thanks for the uh, presentation. Um, just a couple of questions on the, uh, on the growth side of things. Um, with phase two, what, um, what's the expectation in terms of ramp up profile once that plant is commissioned, uh, I guess in the context of um, what pond inventory is expected to be able to support at that time? Um, we've previously provided guidance of two years from commissioning through to, uh, to, um, to full production. Uh, that's not on an, an unreasonable position. And I think the potential as we, opt, as we finalize the details of, uh, of the PON model is for that to be shortened. Um, but I'd be using two years right now in your modeling. Okay, thank you. Um, and then maybe I'm just interested in your comments around the um, potential expansion of the, the, uh, the hydroxide side of things. Um, how can we think about the capex intensity of, say, an additional 10,000 tonne per annum plant, um, I guess in the context of that 60 to 70 million for and stage one and you know, efficiencies from that uh, sunk infrastructure, what, um, yeah, what would be sort of a guide for a potential uh, stage two in that? Uh, I feel a bit, a bit uncomfortable providing guidance on that at the moment, Nick, um, although one would expect some, uh, some capital efficiencies, but, but I, I prefer not to provide any guidance on that at the moment. Okay, sure. Uh, that's it for me. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Your next question comes from Matthew Hocking from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi Richard and team. I've got a few questions. I'll start with an easy one. Uh, the, the pricing uh, quarter to date that you've you've indicated at fourteen thousand a ton uh, is a possible uh, obvious question here. But is that in line with that where you see market pricing uh, over the last few months, or is there any change in the product mix that's helped that realised price? Um, that reflected the market pricing at the time that we entered into the contracts, to be precise, Matt. And if we look at the spot pricing, um, we'll have seen that it has actually softened um, as we've gone into this quarter. Um, and, and, and that's the point that Tara was making, is that the market sentiment may well have some softness in it, but that's based on short-term uh, short termism rather than longer termism. Um, and um, it's not really, not really a good idea to link them too strongly together. Certainly, certainly in terms of contract pricing, uh, if short-termism feelings are extended over a period of time, you'll see that reflected, um, but there'd be significant lags in that, um, and I think that's what we see, the difference between contract pricing and the volatility in short-term pricing. Yep, all, all makes sense, thank you. Um, and the next question, just on the, uh, the announcement earlier in the year about uh, the transition process um, for the CEO role, um, is there any update there? And also, just on the timing, there was guidance that it would be a 12-month process. Is it 12 months to select a candidate or 12 months to have someone in the seat? Well, the process has advanced well and there's some strong candidates and uh, interview process is, uh, uh, is uh, advancing. Um, the 12 month guidance was really to have someone in the seat and to be and to me to be trend uh, and to have a watch of time where I am sitting there in transition mode uh, not to getting someone in the seat okay sure thank you and uh, final question and it's around capital management which might seem a little bit funny given um, the fact you're still de-gearing but when I when I look at the um, the, the level of short interest in the stock, it's 20% of the free float at the moment. You've got, within the joint venture, you know, strong cash generative asset, first quartile of the cost curve, um, and you, by the end of September, you'll have the debt facility, which, which I personally look at a lot more than total um, liabilities because the interrelated uh, loans 
they're not external payments, right? So the actual actual liabilities you can be called upon is a debt facility of US 122 million by the end of September. My question is around um, with the continued positive cash generation within the joint venture and the cash that you've raised sitting in the corporate accounts, which were raised at the start of the year at 750 a share. Um, your current share price is at four bucks. At what point would you need to see the level of um, debt fall to within the JV before you would actually start thinking about a share buyback? Um, I, I imagine you believe your, your share price is undervalued. Um, at what point could you think about allocating some capital to support that? Uh, it's an interesting question, Matt, uh, and one that we've started to talk about at management level just in terms of floating ideas around. Uh, but I have to take, uh, we haven't discussed that at board level yet, um, so it would be inappropriate for me to provide any real comment on that, Matt. All right, straight bat. Thank you very much, mate. Thank you. Your next question comes from Reg Spencer from Canaccord. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. A couple of questions from me on, on the hydroxide. Richard, can you just provide a, a comment as to what have been the changes uh, that's taken place within the project design that's seen those uh, conversion costs uh, more or less half? Um, uh, the biggest one is the reusing of the main reagent. Now, the main reagent there is lime, um, and uh, what we've done is put in more capital in the plant to uh, sorry, the waste product becomes out as, uh, as uh, calcium carbonate. Um, we put more capital in the plant to uh, calcine that back to make it back into lime. So it becomes a reusable calcium ion, really. Uh, that's the major uh, area for cost improvement. Um, the other area is improved uh, losses compared to the original estimate. So we have a more efficient plant uh, with less losses. So that, of course, impacts on your unit cost as well. Okay, understood. Um, I may have missed it uh, when you floated uh, that you may now be looking at a potential expansion of the hydroxide project down the track. Are you in a position to provide any kind of uh, guidance as to when that m you, you might look to uh, embark on that endeavour? No, not, not at all, Reg. What I was really just trying to point out is that in terms of the geographical area we have there, and let me say the, the ability for us to respond to market demand is that we're not limited to that 10,000 tonnes. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the plant area we have and the way that we've done the design for the current plant allows us that flexibility if we decide to do it. So that's all I'm trying to say regarding that. It's not, it's not, it's not constrained uh, to, to just the 10,000 tonnes. Okay, understood. Um, I might just shift over to Borax very, very quickly. Um, you mentioned that uh, market conditions, or you're seeing evidence that market conditions are now improving. Um, if, if I go back and, and have a look uh, over the last 18 months, uh, you guys have uh, contributed almost 13 or 14 million US dollars in, in working cap uh, to, to support the Borax business. Uh, do you foresee a time when, when that support ceases and that Borax stands on its own two legs, or, or you know, do you, you think tough market conditions might prevail? Um, I think what I can say is that um, um, obviously there's some capital works going on there as we as we do the expansion phase and things. So, uh, but outside that, I think we're moving to a position where our support levels should be considerably reduced. Maybe Neil would like to add some comment there. Yeah, uh, Rich. Over the past year, it's been uh, just under nine million that we've uh, supported them with, and uh, in at the moment, we June, July, and August uh, corporately we have not sent down any money to date. So um, yeah, so we've had three months with with nothing flowing uh, corporately down to them. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from Andrew Hodge from Macquarie Group. Please go ahead. Thanks, guys. I've just got three questions. Um, the first one is just uh, on, on the pricing side. Um, I mean, the, the 14000 makes perfect sense. I mean, David said back in December you guys had locked in contracts for the first part of the year, and then you'd obviously delay them from lower production. 
Uh, and so I guess I'm just trying to work out when when do those higher price contracts roll off? Um, and just given the comments that both yourself and Tyra have made about positive pricing, what what's a realistic set of pricing numbers that we should actually be expecting um, sort of for the rest of the year? Um, well, as you know, um, a significant amount of our contracts are actually 12-month contracts with a six-month repricing point. So a lot of our pricing uh, takes us through to the end of December. Um, in terms of what we're looking at this half, yes, conditions are, are a little bit softer out there, but we see no material change uh, to the pricing we had overall in the first half if we want to look at a half-by-half -half basis. Okay. Uh, and, and I guess just as part of that, I mean, uh, like SQM CEO came out this week and saying pricing falling 10% this quarter and then again in, in the final quarter. Um, but you're, you're not seeing that in terms of your numbers? I'm just providing guidance on the half-by-half -half basis that we just talked about. Of course, you've got volatilities within there. Um, but um, leaving it in terms of half-by-half -half guidance, uh, I'm, uh, I'm quite comfortable with what I've just advised. Okay. Uh, and, and I guess just uh, given like a, an outlook on for pricing, you're just saying sort of better than 2018, which, which is obviously FY18, which makes sense. Um, just can you give sort of a, a, a rough idea about uh, what's the sort of the, the target that you guys have and do you have an idea about when you should be hitting nameplate? Uh, sorry, can you say that again? I, I, I missed that. Sure. Uh, I was just you know, The production guidance you give them was just higher than FY18. Um, and I was just trying to get a little bit more specific than that and I'm just kind of asking when do you guys expect to be hitting nameplate um, and what sort of the potential upside that you guys could do in further terms of further the bottlenecking? Uh, well, the challenge always is when you've got variable inputs into a system is that uh, providing guidance, uh, hence why we're coming back to the guidance of just providing uh, that we're going to produce more in this financial year compared to last financial year. Okay, uh, so no timeline yet on hitting nameplate? I'm not providing that guidance. Okay, all right. Uh, and last last question really is just, uh, I, I guess, more probably one for, for Neil. Um, I just wanted to check to see on the taxes side, just um, how should we be kind of thinking about what's the effective tax rate um, at STJ going ahead? Um, just obviously the kind of, I guess, the withholding number looks a little bit higher, and I thought the 13% wasn't going to be kicking in until 2020, and so I just wanted to get an understanding about what's a sort of a more in-line effective tax rate going ahead there. Yeah, I think you could use 35%, uh, uh, Andrew. Basically, um, this all came about with a change in uh, tax legislation or tax law in in Argentina, uh, in terms of the accounting standards, you've got to go ahead and model that all in. So we, you know, you can't just cherry pick and go, uh, okay, we're going to take the reduction in company tax rate, but we're not going to take the increase in dividends. I mean, right now we're not paying dividends, but um, in terms of accounting standards, you've got to build this all in. And uh, there's some detail in one of the notes on the investor presentation slide which give you all the different numbers, but that resulted in a substantial increase uh, in the tax charge that we had to book. It's obviously a non-cash amount that was booked, as well as there's about $3.5 million uh, that we had to book which were related to tax losses brought forward that devalued due to the peso devaluation. So, so that's the one side of it. And to answer your question, so you know, you could look at all of that, and um, you could, if you just pulled it all apart, you'd say company tax rate 25% going forward, withholding tax 13% uh, at its max, so 38%. Uh, I would work on 35%. We're also just looking at different tax structures and etc. with our, our tax advisors. So, I would use for modelling purposes. 35% with an absolute max of 38%. Okay, that's, that's great, Neil. Thank you. Um, and if I could sneak in a, a last sneaky question, just uh, I was going to ask, I mean, what's what's the thing that you're looking forward to getting FID on both uh, on stage two? And obviously, you've been doing early works. You've spent $40 million already. Um, that's a reasonable chunk of the total capex. Uh, and so I just wanted to get an idea about um, what kind of sign you're looking for, or is it uh, trying to lock in um, contracts? 
Now we're just running to the end of the process. I, I think I think our partners underestimated the timing to complete their side of things. And what I'm referring to in terms of their side of things is not only their internal approval process, which is, I'm sure, as you understand, um, understanding Japanese culture and corporate culture is procedural, uh, but also the uh, the uh, timetable for uh, for the debt financing package that uh, is being arranged for the uh, the project as well. So we're just getting to the end of that process. Uh, at the same time, we've been very mindful to make sure that this is really like a resetting of our JV relations. Uh, so there have been certain commercial aspects uh, reflected in the shareholders agreement uh, and the new shareholders agreement for the hydroxide plant that we've had to get in place as well. Uh, so that's added a, um, a layer of complexity for us to also achieve. But as I said, uh, those, those, um, uh, that's also coming to the end, and what we've been negotiating there is to is significantly to our advantage in terms of uh, potentially uh, uh, being able to report our our um, uh, our earnings here on a consolidated basis, and that's been our aim as we restructure the shareholders agreement. Um, so almost there, Andrew. Almost there. Does that mean that uh, that you could potentially be able to try and sort of, I guess, reduce some of the costs or marketing agreements, or potentially market the lithium yourself? Oh, well, we've already negotiated that. Uh, we have a um, announced back in uh, in uh, late January uh, was that as we move forward, uh, we have joint marketing um, on the on the product. Uh, so the relationship with uh, with um, uh, key off takers. Um, and the strategy for our marketing, it becomes a joint function. We will not have a role in the day-to-day -day sales management, uh, but we will have a joint role for both hydroxide and carbonate uh, when it comes to the, uh, the market development and the selection of customers. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Your next question comes from Rahul Anand from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, Richard and team. Thanks for the opportunity. Look, most of them have already been asked, but um, just circling back to the CO2 plant, um, just wanted to get a quick update on how the progress is there and how is it looking for next year. I think uh, from memory that the plant uh, is on site next month and should be being commissioned into the circuit the following month. Um, I think that's the. I think that's. I think that's. Um, I think that's the story at the moment. It may. Okay. I may have actually. I may have got it a couple of weeks late there, but um, that's my my recollection of recent reports. Okay, and then just circling back to the product mix on the back of that. Um, still comfortable with the sort of 33% battery grade for FY18 going to 50% for FY19 or? Um, is there any change to any of those two numbers that we should be taking into account? Well, I think more of the point is uh, th those numbers may be fine, but more of the point is that the as we go th forward is that we to see an increasing amount of battery grade. That's the strategic direction of the project. Uh, and by the time that we get to commissioning the uh, the new plant in 20 in 2020, uh, then we should be running 100% battery grade through the current uh, current circuit. Right. So for next year, it's just year on year. FY19 is expected to be greater than 33 percent. Yes. Is that a fair way to look at it then? And it's yes. not 50 percent anymore. Okay. Yes. Um, and then in terms of the costs, um, so to speak, in terms of um, the delta the CO2 plant creates uh, for the upgrade pro process, could you help me understand sort of how much cost savings there are? Um, on, on the back of the CO2 plant once it's uh, on site and available? Uh, Raul, it's a bit while since I looked at those costs, and rather than contradict something I said earlier, because I seem to remember this being uh, part of Q&A six months ago, I'd prefer to actually go back and check what the numbers are, and we can come back to you on that, Raul. But I don't have the figures in my head at the moment. I don't want to, get, I don't want to mislead uh, and have a wrong figure there. Okay, understood. All right, look, um, I'll leave it there then. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from George Coleman from Arco. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, hi, Richard and team. 
You've noted on uh, slide 17 that um, long-term battery <coughs> hydroxide prices are forecast to retain a 25 100 US uh, a tonne premium um, to battery grade carbonate. Um, I appreciate that it's very early days, but does that hint at the type of transfer pricing formula you may be intending to use for product um, into Japan? And if not, given that the equity splits are the same, what factors are going to um, influence where you intend to harvest the margin? Is it, you know, is it just tax rate? Is it that simple? And then I have one follow-up question, if I may. It's a good question, George. Um, the the intent will be to uh, sell the material, the prime, at the same price as it would be sold to another lithium hydroxide producer. That is the intent. Um, so that av avoids any kind of transfer pricing um, uh, strategy that might be viewed negatively by the Argentine government is to sell the material at market price. Um, and um, uh, it's a matter then of actually uh, determining what market price is, and we're working, working through that with our partners uh, to get the right kind of mix uh, in terms of inputs on that. What was the right. other part okay. of the question, George? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, the second uh, question relates to the uh, the project debt um, facility, and I guess, look, not wanting to um, appear kind of greedy here, but 4.5% uh, looked like a great rate for an unproven project, you know, first uh, brine-based lithium extraction plant in 25 years or thereabouts, 4.5% um, today, uh, particularly uh, through the, um, the eyes of, uh, uh, you know, the um, uh, sort of yen uh, interest rates doesn't look particularly generous for the type of cash flows and the proven hands that uh, Oracobri now represent in terms of running these type of projects? Uh, the, uh, the structure from memory is six month LIBOR plus um, 0.8, 0.9%. Uh, now LIBOR's uh, significantly increased uh, since the time we put that facility in place, um, but that's been covered by the interest rate swap. Uh, so then there's the the, uh, the guarantee charge to Jokmec, um, uh, which is a, a, around about around about one percent from memory. Uh, so that brings up the entire cost of the package to that four point two percent. Yep. Um, right. When we're looking when we're looking further forward, uh, then of course LIBOR has crept up. Um, so you can imagine a similar kind of structure uh, with a premium to LIBOR. Uh, plus a guarantee, um, uh, without providing formal guidance on what the interest rate will be, uh, then then one can do some numbers there and uh, and uh, and come to something reasonable. Yeah. Sure, but I guess what you're saying is there's not much scope for thinking about the reduction in the risk profile that goes with um, downstream processing relative to ah, you know the, the original the project. The downstream processing is different. Uh, and the uh, so I was referring to the stage two expansion, uh, which has got, of course, uh, it's an, it's not in Japan, it's in Argentina. Uh, it has a different risk profile, uh, and yes, certainly we are steadier hands than when we started. Um, but uh, and this will be a highly competitive uh, project financing, much much lower than any other projects that are around the place. Uh, but it won't be at the same level as the Naraha. Um, uh, fi project financing in Japan. Yeah, the, 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 George, the Naraha is is at very very cheap rates. I mean, not even uh, just yes, yes, it, just it's almost giving money away. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's the rates are the Japanese rates you're talking about for Naraha, but in terms of of Oloros, that's a very different profile. Um, so and, that, that, yeah, it was just that comfort I was looking for, Neil. Thanks. Thank you. Your next question comes from Clark Wilkins from Citigroup. Please go ahead. Oh, thanks for taking follow-up questions. Um, two, one, two questions. First off, I think you made a comment earlier about you know, two years ramp up for the, the expansion. You know, what gives you the confidence you can do it that quickly given you know, what we've, you know, what, we're only four years into the Oliver starting, we still have any capacity and there's still no guidance of when you're going to hit capacity for the stage one. And the second one, just in regards to Tara's comments about that sort of the floor price, you know, obviously spot prices are well below that floor price. Now, have you seen any evidence of 
supply coming out of the market yet in China because of the, that weakness in the spot price. Uh, uh, so, um, on the production side and the confidence there, well, we're, we've got a significantly larger pond surface area uh, compared to per, per tonne of production that we have in phase one. Uh, we also uh, will be putting in place um, a bore field that will overproduce in the in the uh, in the ramp up period of pond filling, uh, and as we've noticed, we've already accelerated pond filling to create uh, an inventory to get us going. Uh, so there's a comment there that Neil made regarding the brine inventory. Um, so there's a number of things that give us uh, uh, give us confidence there. Uh, we. We're learning a lot from, we still continue to learn every day about ponds. Um, I don't think that experience is unusual for those who have a background in, in uh, companies that have a, a background in brine processing. Um, and um, our sophistication in terms of modeling and understanding what the parameters are, uh, how you manage that uh, gives us the confidence with our models that we'll get something that is in that range of two years, and as I indicated before, the potential to uh, to bring it earlier. So that's just that's just all in the detail. I'm sorry, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's, I can't be more precise than that. Um, the so what was the second question, Clark? I have problems holding on to two questions today. Uh, the have you seen any evidence of actual supply coming out within China, given that we're you know we've already seen spot prices fall below the sort of floor price that was sort of outlined in the presentation. Now, what we're seeing evidence of is, uh, and it's actually been suppressing the price, uh, is that the high cost producers who, have got, who are carrying debt and others are actually having to sell. Uh, and so rather than managing market in a more disciplined way, uh, they're the ones who actually are making cash and selling product. So these are the higher cost lapidolite producers, uh, the new production from Shanghai Salt Lake. Uh, they need cash and they're turning it into cash, and we're seeing that volatility in the market. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for attending this uh, annual results presentation. Uh, as I said before, uh, it's been a strong year. It's our third, uh, third uh, year of uh, producing profits, uh, and they grow from year to year. Uh, Orocobre has established itself as a profitable, growing lithium producer to living record margins to shareholders. We've got growing profitability. Our growth path is clear and fully funded with Oleros Stage 2 and Naraha. Uh, we have a, a, uh, we're producing high-value chemicals uh, and with strong margins. And as I just mentioned before, we continue to learn. Uh, there's always things we can learn, and uh, I'm very comfortable with the learnings we've been making uh, in our operations. And they will set us apart for de-risking our Stage 2 expansion. Anyway, so thank you for attending, um, and I'll be seeing a number of you as we go on our annual results roadshow. So thank you very much.